Hey everybody, thanks for joining us today for a beginner's guide to knowledge-centered service. I am Lindsay with Beyond 20, and I'm here with Mark Hilliard, who is going to be your presenter today. I'll be facilitating your questions. Um, if we want to go through, I guess we'll go through a little housekeeping first, and then I'm going to be real brief and kick it over to Mark to tell us about Beyond 20 and to tell you about the wonderful world of Case Yes. So first of all, you're all going to be muted throughout the presentation, but if you've got questions as we go through, just put them in the chat box. I'll be monitoring that throughout. We'll save time at the end for questions, but if there's anything particularly relevant to what Mark's saying at the time, I will rudely interrupt him and uh, get your question answered right then. We're going to send a recording of the session after today, within the next 24 hours, I'll promise that, either later today or tomorrow, um, so you can revisit it or send it to your friends and loved ones. And you'll also get an email from us with links to any resources we talk about today, including a link to our KCS training course. So I think that's all I've got. Uh, Mark Hilliard, would you please tell us a little bit about Beyond 20 and a little bit about your fine self and then uh, tell us about KCS. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, my name is Mark Hilliard. Um, I'm a senior advisor with Beyond 20. I've been with the organization for almost eight years now. So been around uh, been around the block a few times. Uh, Beyond 20 is a, a boutique consulting firm. Uh, we are headquartered out of Washington, D.C. Um, we do, uh, as you can see here on this slide, uh, we do some assessments around process. We do design for IT service management. Uh, we also do uh, quite a bit of training around uh, best practice and process as well. Um, we are a partner uh, with several uh, vendors, as you can also see here, um, including Surewell, uh, Come Around, OpsRamp, uh, we're a Microsoft Gold Partner. Um, we work with Beyond Trust and uh, the PM, uh, the Project Management Institute. Um, so our training, our training offerings are kind of across the board. We do a lot, as I said, with um, ITSM. We are uh, authorized training organization with uh, Axelos and PeopleCert for the ITIL framework. Uh, we've been doing that uh, pretty much since the beginning of the organization. Um, <clears throat> as I said, we're also in project management. Uh, we also do uh, we also do some security training and assessments as well um, across uh, several vendors, including ISC Squared, ISACA, and CompTIA. Um, I myself have been in the sphere of, pro of process management and process improvement for uh, a little over a decade, uh, even before I came on with Beyond 20. Uh, learned about ITIL uh, way, way back in 2009. Seems like it was forever ago. Um, Knowledge-centered service um, is such a wonderfully uh, aligned uh, methodology, I think, with process management, and that is why uh, we as an organization actually really uh, support and advocate for its use. Um, so uh, this particular webinar is really going to just sort of be a bit of a primer, um, just kind of give folks an idea of what KCS is, um, where it comes from, uh, what uh, what problem we're trying to solve, and uh, how it can really help us out um, as organizations. Uh, as, as an organization, um, you know, we are all these days knowledge workers, right? Um, what we know and what we and our skills are really uh, are really our stock in trade um, in the information uh, in the information technology and service management industry. Um, so KCS has a really great quote, I think, about itself. Uh, this comes from the the founding consortium, um, which is KCS is not something we do in addition to solving problems. KCS becomes the way that we solve problems. Um, and I really like this quote because what it really uh, indicates is that KCS is, is not just a methodology, but it is a culture shift. Uh, the idea that how we work, how we resolve incidents um, changes, fundamentally changes because uh, we adopt the KCS methodology. So rather than just tasking us with just you know more work, um, which I'm sure we've all experienced in our careers, um, KCS looks to transform the way that we work and allows us to become more effective and more efficient at handling uh, incidents and issues that our customers raise with us. KCS is older than a lot of people know. Um, the Consortium for Service Innovation, uh, who are the owners of the, the Knowledge-Centered Service methodology, was actually established uh, 
uh, way back in 1992. Um, even I was young when uh, KCS came into being. Um, it is a methodology, um, and that is, and that's kind of uh, kind of a key thing. We talk uh, a lot in various uh, various parts of our practice about methodologies and frameworks and standards and how they differ. Um, and you know, in this case, um, KCS is a methodology, which means it is sort of a prescriptive way of working. Um, but what it's really uh, what it's really centered on is this idea that um, that we all have knowledge, right? We we all know a lot of things, um, and as professionals in you know the service management industry, we have to leverage that knowledge on a regular basis. So this methodology focuses on creating improving and reusing that knowledge uh, in a more structured um, and more efficient manner. Um, <clears throat> it also says uh, or also states pretty explicitly that it looks to en enhance the content of our knowledge bases uh, based on demand and usage. Um, whereas, you know, historically our knowledge bases were created or purchased from someone else, uh, KCS says that's a waste of time, frankly. Uh, you can adopt a bunch of other people's knowledge that it doesn't really apply to your customer base, but how much of that knowledge will ever actually get leveraged or used in order to resolve issues. Uh, instead, what KCS says is we should be creating that knowledge and improving that knowledge um, as it is demanded of us. Right? That, that way we have the ability to say, hey, you know, this knowledge article gets a lot of use because we created it when someone asked about it. Um, and that is that is one of the one of the cornerstones of the methodology. Um, it is based heavily on our collective experience. Again, um, you know, none of us is as smart as all of us at the end of the day, um, and we all depend on one another uh, day in and day out to uh, to assist in solving problems and finding uh, you know finding creative solutions across the board. Um, which means, you know, knowledge-centered service is also very much around collaboration and sharing. Um, there's also the concept, as with so many frameworks and standards and methodologies, of continually improving uh, our knowledge, and that is uh, that is kind of how KCS works uh, in a practical uh, a practical uh, sense. So here's the problem. This is the problem that KCS is really is really uh, you know came into being to solve. Most of the knowledge that we have is what we call tacit knowledge. Uh, tacit knowledge is those things that we know, but if you asked us what we know, we probably couldn't tell you unless you specifically asked about that one thing, right? Um, you know, I know how to tie my shoes. I've known how to tie my shoes since I was you know. Well, I'm not going to say 10, but maybe a little before that. Um, no, I've known how to tie my shoes most of my life, right? It is just something I know how to do. If you asked me, tell me all the things you know how to do, Mark, chances are I would probably not include how to tie my shoes in that list unless you said, hey, Mark, do you know how to tie your shoes? And can you show me? Then, yes, I would absolutely say, of course, I know how to tie my shoes. And here's how you do it. So tacit knowledge is that knowledge that isn't really formalized or documented anywhere. It's just in our heads. And most of the knowledge we have is in our heads. We, we have not written it down. We have not necessarily shared it unless asked specifically about it. One of the other things uh, it, within this problem is that a lot of the time, um, especially in IT, um, in my career, uh, technicians, practitioners don't share their specialized knowledge because they're in an environment where they are afraid by sharing their knowledge, they become less valuable, right? Um, I think that uh, even, even I fell victim to this early in my career. If I learned something new, I didn't wanna tell the other people around me that were working with me because that would somehow dilute me and my skills um, and I would be less valuable to the organization. Having being the only one that knew and keeping that information close to the best, I felt was some way in some way protecting me. Now, I came up in IT in the, uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, so I remember the dot-com bust. I remember the layoffs. I remember people, um, you know, half of Silicon Valley going homeless um, for, for quite some time. Um, so I also understand this mentality very, very, uh, very explicitly. Um, but the reality is, is that actually I'm not helping anybody by keeping it close to the vest. I'm not helping, I'm not helping anybody out by not sharing what I know. And by sharing what I know, people will begin to trust and people will begin to share what they know. And we all become smarter and we all become more effective because of it. Also, a lot of the time, 
organizations will look at knowledge and consider it to be proprietary, basically that, you know, only an expert, only a subject matter expert could possibly create a meaningful knowledge article. And that's just fallacy. The reality is, is that the people closest to the issues, the people closest to the work, the practitioners that are day in and day out resolving these issues and fulfilling requests, they actually probably have more knowledge, more useful demand-driven knowledge than the people who wrote the systems they're supporting in the first place. Now, it's not to say that experts are not important. We, we, we certainly need them. We need subject matter experts to fill in some of those gaps and those blanks. But the reality is, is that knowledge is probably most effective for those people who are living it every day. The other thing is, um, and I mentioned this earlier, but most of the content out there in knowledge bases isn't demand driven. We're either going out and buying a knowledge base from some, you know, some, some company or we're trying to preload a bunch of knowledge articles before we can, before we even launch a service or a system, right? We were like, well, this is what people will ask for. And then what we find out, and, and likely many, many on this uh, webinar have experienced is, you know, half of that stuff we painstakingly wrote and put in beautiful graphics and screenshots of, nobody ever asks about, it, never actually gets used. So that time feels very wasted in the end. So these are a lot of the things that, that have happened sort of in knowledge management over the years that, uh, that really drove the consortium to what they decided to do. So knowledge itself, um, just to kind of kind of level set how KCS and how the consortium sees knowledge. Um, first off, it's gained through interaction and experience mostly. Um, you know, we've all got book knowledge, right? Many of us went to school and have degrees and have read, you know, countless tomes on the things that we do. But for the most part, our knowledge is experiential. Over time, we gain knowledge through doing our jobs, through uh, interacting with our customers, with inter interacting with other ex experts, um, asking questions, those sorts of things are actually how most of our knowledge is gained over time. We also never stop gaining knowledge, right? Knowledge is one of those things that, you know, it continues to grow throughout our lifetime um, and throughout our careers. Um, you know, my mother will be 86 years old next week. Um, and she still learns new things, right? She is learning how to use her iPhone now, which is pretty awesome. I get to send her pictures from across the country, which she finds super amazing um, that I can just send her photos of what's going on uh, on, the, on the East Coast. Um, so we never stop learning, right? Which means that knowledge never stops changing. We are constantly shifting um, our knowledge and shifting what needs to be known. Um, that third item there, that knowledge is actually never 100% complete. Again, it always, it's always changing, we're always learning, but it's also never 100% accurate. There aren't a lot of things that we know with 100% certainty, right? And, and we can, this, this is borne out in, um, for those of us that do service management and work in the IT industry, you know, if we had 100% certainty about things, we wouldn't have to actually investigate anything. There would be no research required because we would already know. So knowledge is never 100% accurate. This helps a lot when we start talking about creating knowledge articles and reusing knowledge articles and improving knowledge articles within the KCS methodology. Um, and then finally, of course, our knowledge is validated through its use, our experience, and our interactions. Right? Again, not subject matter experts. Subject matter experts don't really validate what we know. Think about how you validate the things you know that have nothing to do with your job, right? Um, you could take the most basic thing. You walk up to a stove and you put your hand on a burner and it's really hot and you pull your hand away. You just validated to yourself that that is very hot and you do not like hot things on your hand, right? You didn't need the person who built, designed and engineered the stove to come to you and go, when the stove is hot, it's very hot and you shouldn't put your hand on it. You learned by doing it. You learned by putting your hand on there and burning yourself. Now, hopefully most of us haven't done that, but um, I, I am not in that crowd. I am one who definitely did that as a child. Um, I used an exhaust manifold from a riding lawnmower, but I learned very quickly and I gained the knowledge that you should not put your hand on a, the exhaust manifold of a riding lawnmower or any other combustion engine vehicle on the planet. And I haven't done so since. So I gained knowledge and it was validated through experience. Um, I did not need an expert, you know, I did not need the engineer to tell me that, right? So that's, that's what we talk about. We start talking about demand-driven and collective experience-based knowledge. There are four primary principles 
to knowledge-centered service. Knowledge-centered service is based on these four core principles. The first one is abundance. The idea behind abundance is that the more we share, the more we learn. And that is true of knowledge. It's not true of everything. If you consider to, in, in your head, if you think about it, if you say, hey, um, you know, if I have an apple and I want to give half of my apple to Lindsay and I cut the apple in half and I give Lindsay the other half of the apple. Thank you. Then Lindsay and I both have, you're welcome, both of, I, both of us then have half of an apple. I have reduced the amount of apple I have by 50%. And I have only, and, and while I have increased the amount of apple that Lindsay has, she still only has half of an apple. And then if she decides that she would like to share half of her half, she has now cut herself in half. And the next person that she shares it with only gets a quarter of an apple. Not so with knowledge. The wonderful thing about knowledge it is, is that it is self-perpetuating. If I have an idea and I share that idea with Lindsay, we both now have an entire idea. We've multiplied. We haven't just divided something into smaller parts so that both of us can get something. We've multiplied so that both of us get everything. And that is, the, that is really very core to the idea of, of knowledge-centered service. The more we share, the more we learn, and the better we are collectively. The second core value, uh, or core principle, I should say, is to create value, is to think holistically, right? We want to think about what we're doing and how it actually contributes to the overall outcomes and business objectives that we're trying to support. Having additional knowledge, being able to share that with other people, we're increasing our value, but we're also increasing value overall outcomes and overall outcomes and objectives for our customers. Number three, knowledge is demand driven. Um, I've already mentioned it twice, so you know it's definitely important to, to KCS. Um, demand driven basically means that it needs to be relevant and it is a byproduct of our interactions, right? Again, I could write a hundred knowledge articles today for a service that doesn't yet exist. And I could put that service out there and hope that I answered everybody's questions. But the chances of my doing even 50% well at that are pretty slim. Most of the knowledge that we need to create comes from the demand of, our, of the consumer, right? The consumer is gonna come to us and say, this is what I need help with. That gives us the opportunity in the moment to create knowledge, right? To actually codify that tacit knowledge in the context that customers need, because they're going to give us the language that they use to ask the question. And if we take that and we, we put the knowledge into their context so that they can understand the answer, it's that much more valuable to the next customer who likely has a very similar language or context to that first customer. The last one, and you know, maybe the most important one, is trust. Um, this is where the culture shift really, really depends heavily on buy-in across the board. Um, we have to trust that our knowledge workers are, are in fact going to do this. We have to trust that the knowledge will come, that the organization of the knowledge will actually improve over time and that it will be valuable. And we have to trust our frontline folks, the folks who are literally answering the phones and, and resolving these issues as a day in and day out basis. We have to trust them. We have to trust that they know what they're doing, right? And we do, at least, you know, in theory, if we didn't, why did we, why do we have them? <laughs> why did we hire someone if we don't trust them? We trust that they know what they're doing, right? So we trust them to create the knowledge um, that helps provide valuable outcomes to customers. So those are the four core principles and they are very, very key to the overall success of knowledge-centered service. There are 10 core concepts. I'm not gonna go super deep into the 10 core concepts. We'd be here all day, but they're on the first five, I kind of feel like the first five go together and the second five go together with each other uh, based on what's here. Um, you know, this idea of continuous improvement Again, it depends so heavily on several of these items, the buy-in, the, the, the leadership, our collective experience, that collective ownership that we are all responsible ultimately for knowledge. Um, those first five, I, like I said, those kind of make up, uh, make up sort of one bundle of concepts to me. Um, they're all very reliant on one another, very dependent um, in order to help transform and improve over time. Um, the second half, again, is understanding, so seeking to understand before seeking to solve. And there are 
again, five things here that all kind of are very dependent and reliant on one another. Um, I'm, I'm really, really bully on, uh, on number seven there. That's sufficient to solve. Um, the other thing that we tend to run into in knowledge management is you have to have a perfect knowledge article before it can be published. Why? Right. It's, it's, a weird, it's a weird thing to request. Right. Make sure your knowledge is perfect before anybody uses it. That's not true in any other aspect of our lives. Right. I say I know something or I have, a, I have an inkling of something out loud to people all the time before I have the perfect sentence or the perfect statement to make about that thing. So why are we holding on to this knowledge until it's perfect? Sufficient to solve basically is a, is a concept that says, look, we have knowledge, we should be sharing it. You know, if, if, what we, if what we did solved the issue, we need to share that with as many people as we can. And the nice thing about that is because KCS believes in continual improvement, other people with whom we share it can improve upon it and make it closer to perfect. They can make that knowledge better. They can improve the quality. They can improve the accuracy over time. If what we did solved the issue in the moment, that is sufficient, right? That's as much as we need to know in order to share that knowledge with others. We do it, like I said, we do it in our lives. This is all stuff we already do. We just, you know, we just, for some reason, we just couldn't get over this hump in our, <laughs> in our organizations that, you know, knowledge doesn't have to be perfect. Knowledge just has to be enough. Um, integrating knowledge, obviously, into everything we do, this goes back to the original quote from the consortium, right? It's how we solve problems. Um, coaching is a big part of KCS. Um, you know, we, we, have the, we have the people who are creating the knowledge, but we do need folks who are able to sort of mentor and bring along the, the, the newbies, right? Um, not, everyone is, uh, not everyone is yet completely uh, inured in, uh, in, the, in KCS. So we do need folks who have a little bit more experience and a little bit, you know, a little bit more. Does that mean that these people are managers? Not really. It means that they are the ones that are mentoring the ones who have not yet uh, have not yet had a lot of experience with it. Um, and then finally, we have to continually reassess the value of what we're doing. The whole program, all the way down to individual uh, articles. Right? We're going to be constantly coming back and improving on what we're doing. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. So, how does KCS actually help? I get to throw you guys some actual numbers here. Um, first is Incident resolution time. If I told you I could give you a, a methodology that tomorrow could start to bring you to 50, 50 to 60 percent improvement in time to resolution, you would probably say, "That's awesome. Where do I sign up?" I know I would. I, I find that to be an, a, a very compelling number, and that number is actually based on industry uh, on industry fact. So the fact that you can improve your in your incident resolution rate by 50%, that time to resolution is just phenomenal. Um, the next one there may be even more important from my perspective, and that is, is that we are actually reducing the amount of time necessary to get our technicians up to speed by up to 70%. And when you consider those next two bullets, that is pretty compelling. The average time to proficiency today for a service desk technician starting out is between four and six months. And the average time that a service desk technician stays in a service desk technician role is 18 to 24 months. That means that for a quarter to a third of the time that service desk technicians are in our employ, they're being trained, which means they are not being productive, really. And on top of that, it's not just that technician, the new technician that's having to be trained for half a year, it's also the folks that have to take time out of their already undoubtedly overworked and overly busy days in order to help that person get up to speed. So not only do we not have this person in rotation for the first half a year they work for us, the first third of the whole time we'll have them, we're also pulling our most experienced, our most knowledgeable people out of their normal work rotation in order to bring that person up to speed. If we can reduce that down to a matter of weeks, through knowledge-centered service, why, you know, why wouldn't you do it? <laughs> I mean, there's, there's, it almost doesn't seem like any good argument against that, right? If I can take it from four months to five weeks, yeah, let's do that. Let's make that happen. Self-service. Um, 
self-service knowledge, right? I mean, we, we, we in service management talk about self-service and how transformative it can be, um, you know, providing, you know, providing people the ability to go in and handle their own incidents. The, what we sometimes fall short on is providing them the knowledge to make self-service truly uh, transformative. We put a few things out there. They can do self-service password reset. Uh, they could do self-service request time off, right? Um, some of those things without having to call someone or send an email, they can do this through a self-service portal. But the reality is, is that we don't put the more important stuff out there, the knowledge that might help them solve actual issues with their own situ in their own situations, right? We don't give them the knowledge directly that they can utilize, that they can then leverage to figure out on their own, um, which makes them empowered, which is valuable to them. And frankly, it frees up our time <laughs> as a service provider, right? Like if, you, if all my people are going to self-service, I got time to learn new things and build better systems and improve customer experience all across the board. So self-service is a, is a huge, uh, self-service knowledge is a huge, uh, huge benefit. Um, finally, this idea of organizational learning, the fact that we are able then to provide even better information to our problem management practice so they can do better root cause analysis and they can have better problem resolution over the long haul because we're constantly creating and improving and reusing knowledge so that when an incident occurs or when a series of incidents occurs, that trend is not only easy to see, the resolution is very obvious to problem management so that they have the ability to solve the problem permanently. And I think that's a, that's a big operational win as well. There are also some great strategic wins and benefits from KCS. Um, and these, of course, make, make the business very happy. Reduction in cost. Redu reducing our cost to manage and resolve incidents by half is just phenomenal to me, right? The fact that we can, we can actually reduce our overall cost for incident management by 50%. What could you do with 50% more money in your budget every year? <laughs> um, <laughs> That, you know, as a, if you, if you run your service desk, like what could you do with, if you cut your costs in half? Um, higher customer satisfaction, it's always, always a byproduct of sharing more knowledge, of providing that self-service, of getting things done faster and more efficiently. Customers are always going to be happier with that. Maybe more importantly from our side, higher employee satisfaction and lower turnover. Um, very interesting. Although, you know, I don't know that it necessarily makes service desk uh, employees want to stay on the service desk longer. Um, you likely will have employees who want to stay with the organization longer when they feel that there is a culture of improvement and a culture of knowledge sharing in place. Because I know that every job I've ever worked at where I learned every day, where I gained knowledge and I got more proficient at things every single day, those were the jobs I held on to the longest. Those were the ones where I stayed as long as I possibly could to just try and get every last drop of knowledge out of it. Um, so I think that that is, a, that is really one of the reasons for that benefit of, uh, of employees not leaving, right? We want to we wanna keep them anyway, but reducing those things by 35 and 40% is, is pretty big. Okay, enough with numbers, enough with, enough with the rah-rah. Um, let's talk a little bit about how KCS actually works. So KCS works on this idea of a double loop process. Double loop process comes from um, a, a learning methodology that was established in the 1970s by some guys at some really important college somewhere in the Northeast, I think. Um, I think it was done at like MIT or Harvard, but anyway. Nailed it. Um, <laughs> coming back, <laughs> coming back uh, around to what it actually does. The idea here is that uh, we have two loops that are feeding one another constantly. Um, in KCS, we have what's called the solve loop, and then we have the evolve loop. The solve loop is the operational side. This is where our practitioners live, right? Every day, day in, day out, we're capturing information, we're structuring our knowledge, we're reusing our knowledge, and we're improving it every single time. Somebody calls in with a problem or an issue, we look at it, we look for it. If we already have knowledge in the base, and we already have knowledge in the knowledge base for it, we use that knowledge and we look to improve it every single time. If there is nothing in the knowledge base, we should create it right there and then, right? We take the customer's context, we put it into that knowledge article right out of the gate. We start that, that and that's how it becomes how we solve issues, right? Rather than we're gonna do this, we're gonna go through, we'll do incident management, we'll escalate to an SME, the SME will take care of it and they'll respond with you know 
and I certainly having been an SME, I know my favorite response to the service desk was done, which is really helpful in teaching the service desk how to fix issues themselves going forward, right? Instead of doing that, why don't we just make the knowledge part how we solve the issue, right? Instead of, instead of running around like this, why don't we just take what the customer is telling us, write that into an article, find the solution, write that into the article, and we have a knowledge article. That's all we got to do, right? Instead of, instead of the, you know, the massive ping pongs and escalations, and then after the whole thing is closed, we come back and go, how did we solve that again? Should we write an article about this? Does anything exist for it? If we do it in the moment, first off, we're getting that demand-driven knowledge uh, recording. Um, we're not forgetting what we did, because that's always a big problem if we wait until after the whole thing is resolved and closed. Um, and if there is knowledge, every, every incident that comes in, every issue that is raised by our customers is another opportunity to improve that knowledge, right? Is to add more context, to add better resolution, to add more efficiency. Um, and that's what that solve loop is there for, right? We're just continually reusing, capturing, creating, and improving over and over and over again. Um, and that improves our knowledge, <clears throat> excuse me, that improves our knowledge uh, pretty substantially and fairly quickly um, if, that's, if that's the way we go. It is generally governed by policy and procedures. Right? It is a methodology, which means we do have uh, prescriptive policies and procedures and processes in place to manage, um, to manage the knowledge-centered service practice. That is where the evolve loop comes in. The evolve loop is there, and you can see you can see the four practices there. It's concerned with content health. Is our con is 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 our content of high quality? We actually have what is called an article quality index uh, that tells us, you know, how 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 high quality is the content that is being created and reused. Um, process integration. You know, are we integrating this knowledge with existing processes? Do you know are our processes getting in the way? Um, this is something that the evolve loop or the solve loop can actually feed into the evolve side of things, right? I can actually suggest as a knowledge worker on the front lines that, hey, you know what, we have this process, but honestly, we could do so much to improve it. Based on what we do out here on the floor, helping people out, we think that this process should work this way because this is more effective and more efficient and our customers will be more satisfied, right? So integrating knowledge into our processes becomes part of that strategic or tactical evolve loop. Uh, performance assessment, of course, again, it's a methodology. We wanna make sure that people are in fact being managed and that, that, that governance and policy is actually being followed. Um, finally, leadership and communication. Um, it doesn't work if leadership isn't in, bottom line. Most things don't work if leadership isn't in, <laughs> let's face it. Uh, but this really doesn't work if leadership isn't in, right? If, if leadership doesn't, doesn't find value in this, if they are not bought into the idea that KCS can help transform and improve, and if you can't compel them, you know, if we can't compel them with the numbers I just went over in the last couple of slides, it's going to be a serious uphill battle. Right, I, and, and you need to have them bought into this concept that, hey, you know what, KCS can help and will. Um, so their buy-in and the communication to and from leadership must be there, um, but that's a big part of the Evolve Loop too. They're the ones that are gonna be, they're not only the ones who are going to manage uh, the governance and write the policies, they also have to be big cheerleaders and advocates for it as well. They need to be letting folks know just how successful this sort of thing is and can be. So how do we do that? How do we get that buy-in? The, the what's in it for me question, right? Because we all have to go back to our leadership and say, we really wanna do this and it's gonna cost time and it's gonna cost money and it's gonna cost resources and it involves a culture shift and people are gonna have to you know, get on board and it's gonna be, and, 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 and yeah, honestly, it's, it's gonna be hard, right? It's not, it's not gonna be like, you know, climbing Mount Everest hard, but it's not something you just one day go, hi, we're doing KCS now. It does take some time and effort. So what's in it for me? How do we answer that question? Well, first off, start with what your business's objectives are. You know, I, I rattled off numbers earlier in statistics. Redu reduced time to resolve is always a huge compelling thing. The business is, is, is interested in three things, customers, the business itself, 
and its employees. All those things are, you know, in varying degrees of importance, depending on the day and the situation, I would assume. But if we can say, hey, look, if we do KCS, we're gonna reduce time to resolve and that's gonna improve our customer, our, our customer's satisfaction rate, which means they will likely recommend us, which means we'll only increase our business going forward. Hey, look at that. There's, you know, there's a compelling argument right there because that's what the business is actually, that's what we're in business for, right? <laughs> is to have customers and to have them give us money for our products and services. So if knowledge-centered service can improve all of that and increase all of that, Statistically speaking, that's a great selling point. The other thing you wanna do is you wanna make sure you link those KCS benefits to the valuable outcomes. Again, those reduced resolution times, that's a very customer focused thing. Reduced support costs and reduced repeat incidents, right? That's very business, that's very internal focused, internally focused, but you know, if we're helping our internal customers out and we're making them more efficient, they're gonna be more efficient at helping external customers. Um, and then finally, that shared knowledge and collaboration. I don't think there's probably very many businesses in the world or very many organizations that don't care about their employees, right? I, and, and I've worked in some organizations that certainly felt that way <laughs> in my career. Um, but the reality is, is that, you know, businesses know what keeps them going. It's their employees, right? People are our most valuable asset pretty much always and forever. Um, so businesses are employee focused and you want that employee satisfaction. You want low turnover. Turnover is not only annoying and irritating for those of us who have to survive through it at the, you know, on the front lines and in, in the middle management sphere, it's expensive. It's expensive to hire and train new people. If you look back at that, you know, four to six months to train up a new, uh, a, a new service desk technician before they're actually and that's to get them to 100% autonomy, right? They don't have to have someone over their shoulder all day long helping them do their job, right? Four to six months. That's a long time to have to have a mentor who's constantly checking up uh, before you can actually fly solo. It's expensive to get new people on. It's expensive to train new people and increase skill sets. It's expensive. I mean, why wouldn't you wanna do something that made people wanna stay and wanna grow? Um, you know, KCS helps that. It fosters this idea that we are all improving our knowledge together constantly. We're all getting smarter every day. We're all getting better at our jobs every day. We're learning more. We're getting better skills. And most of us, I think, certainly the people that I've worked with over my time in IT and in service management, want to learn more always, no matter how brilliant, knowledgeable, and skilled they may be, they're always looking to learn more. In fact, the people I've worked with and known in my life and career who were the most skilled and the most knowledgeable were also the ones that wanted to learn the most still. They still wanted to push. And KCS does that. KCS, by its very nature, gives us more and more knowledge every single day. So, how does one Im, uh, implement KCS? Well, KCS is, like I said, there, there's a lot to it. And we, we, we don't have time to go into all the ins and outs. But one of the things that uh, certainly enables knowledge-centered service pretty heavily are tools and technology. Um, can you do it without a tool? Yeah, you can. It's not absolutely necessary. But, or however, as I like to say, however, it's very hard. If you think about your service desk, if you think about service desk technicians and subject matter experts and all of the moving parts that go on with incident resolution and problems and change and all the stuff that's going on every single day today within an IT service management organization, consider trying to do that on notepads with pencils passing around post-it notes all day long. Can you do it? Yeah, should you do it? Eh, I, would, I would argue no, <laughs> I would say that that's, that is a bridge too far. Uh, the, the amount of staff you would need, and it just it just doesn't feel like it would really work very well. I don't know of any service desk that's trying to do that at this point, really of any size. And I've worked with service desks of two or three people to service desks of thousands of people in the time that I've been doing this job, and none of them are working without a tool. <laughs> so um, knowledge management uh, and KCS uh, it, it specifically, um, does definitely lend itself well to tools and technology. Now, there are dedicated knowledge 
uh, knowledge management tools out there, certainly plenty of them. Um, do they integrate well with ITSM tools, which are, you know, your CMS, the way that you, the way that you handle incidents and changes in the repository where you store all that data? Um, there is always some level of integration. There needs to be some level of integration, I believe. Um, I think it's really, really important that your knowledge tool, if it is separate from your ITSM tool, um, that they do, in fact, integrate with one another. Uh, because while I'm doing an incident, I want to be able to leverage that knowledge right away. And I want to be able to add knowledge to that tool right away as well. And it's certainly always more tedious to have to swivel seat, right? If, even if I just have to alt tab between two programs, oy, that's just so, so tedious. So yeah, integration, I think, is pretty key. Now, KCS does verify tools and technology. They also verify uh, service, uh, service providers as well. Um, are there a lot of KCS verified tools? No, there are not. Um, there are actually very few KCS verified tools. Um, Come Around uh, is an organization that we work with, with at Beyond 20. They have a dedicated KCS tool, a dedicated knowledge tool. It integrates with lots of ITSM, uh, ITSM platforms. It, it integrates quite nicely with uh, Surewell Service Management. Uh, which is a platform that we also uh, that we also implement at Beyond 20. Um, it 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 also integrates with others uh, with with Remedy and with you know some of the other big ones. It also it also integrates with ServiceNow, um, which we're also a partner with. But ServiceNow itself is also KCS v6 certified, which means that you know when the when the new version came out, it's on version six. We've been through six major major iterations of KCS since its um, uh, since its uh, invention. Um, ServiceNow uh, actually got verified for V6 as an ITSM tool with a knowledge component or knowledge module attached to it. Um, so it is actually natively able to support the KCS methodology. It doesn't require any uh, additional integrations, which I think is also kind of nice. Uh, but if you have, you know, if you already have an ITSM tool in place and it doesn't happen to be ServiceNow, <laughs> um, as I said, tools like Come Around uh, do integrate with many of them. Um, as well. So tools are pretty awesome. Um, you know, they make us more efficient. Right? Tools don't necessarily make us more effective, but they do make us more efficient. Um, and so leveraging a tool to do this sort of thing, to make KCS a part of your practice and part of your organization, um, I think is pretty critical. So that is that is KCS in a nutshell. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open it up. I think uh, um, you mentioned, Lindsay, that we have a few, we have a couple of questions. So um, we'll open it up and have you ask those and see if I can actually answer them. <laughs> I, uh, I believe in you, first of all. We've got, yeah, we've actually got quite a few questions. So I'm going to take it from the top here. And this first one, I'm going to read verbatim because it was a question that I had myself. Uh, this is going back to, if you want to go back to slide 10, no pressure to the core concepts. It's around number seven, sufficient to solve. So John's asking, how do we handle the philosophy of, quote, a little knowledge is dangerous when we talk about number seven, i.e. having an incomplete knowledge article, is that actually dangerous? Can you speak to that a little bit? I think you touched on that with the policies on the double loop, but how do you ensure that these, these articles are, aren't causing more harm than good? Uh, that actually is, it's an excellent question. <laughs> um, and, and the little knowledge is dangerous is certainly a, a mantra that I have lived by in my career. Yeah, sufficient to solve is not to say that you want incomplete knowledge. You want to have, you want to have something that does in fact work. Um, and that is where a lot of the roles and what, what they call licensing in KCS comes into play. Licensing basically states that we have various, we do have various level, levels, like we, ha we have leaders and we have actual knowledge workers, and then we actually also have coaches. Um, within sort of the worker sphere, the licensing for workers, we have what are called candidates, contributors, and publishers. A candidate is someone who can use knowledge um, and they can flag knowledge to say, hey, I think I found something that improves on this but they don't have the ability to literally publish that stuff out for people to share. They're not yet considered sort of to have enough experience with it um, in order to be able to share it. Contributors and publishers have more, uh, they definitely have more autonomy when that comes to it. Publishers can actually create new articles and actually publish those articles out to, to the end. So we do, we do to some extent have, uh, you know, have some, quality gates in place. Um, and even in the solve loop, we have quality gates in place that says, 
you know, if you are new at this, <laughs> and a lot of us will be new at it when it starts, if you're new at this, you are going to get to leverage knowledge and reuse knowledge, and your contribution to knowledge will be to say, I'm flagging this article because I think I found a correction or I think I found something better. So there are going to be folks, you know, contributors and publishers who can edit and create um, uh, respectively. Um, so those folks have more experience. They're going to put out knowledge. They're going to share knowledge out there, especially with customers, but also with other, you know, with, with other knowledge workers. Um, that is definitely a little bit more, a little bit more vetted. Now, you know, is it possible we, you know, something slips through and a knowledge article, you know, gives some bad advice? Sure. But that's going to be true if all you're doing is writing up a giant bank of knowledge articles and then shoving them out there on day one of service as well. You know, that that risk does not go away with KCS. It can happen. Absolutely. We're human. We make mistakes. But the, the way that the licensing model works, we really try to minimize that risk by ensuring those people who are, you know, kind of identified as mentors or more experienced are the ones who are actually, you know, vetting finally at the end going, yep, you're absolutely right. I tested this out. You're totally correct. This is, needs to go into the article and this is what's going to go out to customers and to other knowledge workers. So we don't necessarily, anything that has not been published, has not been flagged as published by a publisher, <clears throat> is always considered to be what we call WIP or work in progress. Um, so there are, you know, at any given time, there's a lot of knowledge articles that are sitting in work in progress, sort of waiting to be, you know, kind of waiting to become published articles. And, you know, when you are just a candidate, when you are someone who's just leveraging the knowledge and just learning and just getting started, um, you know, what, what is generally expected of you is that you are going to flag a lot of articles. You're going to say, hey, I think there's an improvement that can be made here and suggesting that improvement. I don't get to actually update the article. Um, and, and it has to, you know, someone with the higher level license, someone who is a contributor or a publisher needs to check it and go, yep, nope, you're absolutely right, Mark. Um, you, we, we got it wrong the first time and it is better that we update this. And that's the idea of continual improvement because we do recognize that not every piece of knowledge out there is going to be 100% accurate, but we do try to minimize the risk of putting out a bunch of garbage, frankly, <laughs> by ensuring that the people with more experience are the ones that are kind of that final quality gate before we put it out there. And as you said, Lindsay, yeah, in the Evolve loop, we have that content health uh, practice, which is really very, very concerned with looking at the quality of the articles that are out there um, and kind of driving better coaching and better mentoring. Again, it's not to, not, it's to hold people accountable, but not in a negative way. It's to say, hey, you know what? We're noticing that, you know, Mark's articles have consistently been just a little bit, you know, left of center, um, and we need to we need to figure out how to correct that. You know, the evolve loop is there to help find those sorts of issues and correct them without, you know, without derailing the whole program. Without saying, well, you know, Mark put out five articles last month with a mistake in them, and now, you know, everybody's dying is dying at their computers because he told them all to do something that sort of thing really is minimized by the fact that there are eyes on these knowledge articles all the time. And because the articles are demand driven, only those articles that are actually relevant and being asked for are the ones that are getting created. Um, and so they're likely going to be asked for a lot, which means there's going to be a lot of opportunity for people to improve upon them very rapidly um, during their life cycle. So that is the sufficient to solve is, is really meant to, meant to get us, putting knowledge down, you know, getting it down on paper in the moment, um, and then refining that knowledge over time. Excellent. Okay, <clears throat> I'm going to get creative and consolidate a couple different questions around culture that we've had come in. This seems like a pretty big culture shift for the organization as a whole, but especially for the service desk team. So if you could speak a little bit to how you would go about getting buy-in from the service desk teams and and what what kind of overhaul does moving to KCS have in terms of the day-to-day -day life of the service desk team? Excellent question. Um, in two parts, no less. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> the culture shift, uh, you know, the, the interesting thing is um, for, for those those organizations that I've worked with who um, who have adopted and are adopting KCS, by and large, the, the service desk generally ends up being the ones that are scrambling for it. 
you know, I think the buy-in, once you sort of just see how, if you can kind of, you, you know, you want, I mean, you want to, you're going to have to train people, you're going to have to show them how it works. But I think once people see it, even just a little bit in practice, um, and just how much, you know, how much easier it is to actually do my job if, you know, if I have all of this knowledge already at my disposal and I'm sharing what I know with other people and, in, you know, getting encouragement and encouraging others and learning a ton and, and even teaching other people things that I know, for the most part, you know, most service desk folks that I've encountered are like, yeah, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. I, I get, you know, I get to learn things every day. I get, you know, I get, I feel like I'm getting smarter. You know, I'm going to skill up so much faster. Um, I have happier people calling, you know, people calling me and, and I'm solving their issues rapidly, which makes them happy, which means I don't get yelled at by customers all day long, which, you know, I've worked the service desk. I know the, you know, the compliments generally are somewhat outnumbered by the complaints, um, just maybe a little tiny bit. Um, so I think, I think the, the, the big, the big sort of buy-in from the service desk is, is really going to be part of the experience is to say, is to show them, is to get them involved in doing this. Um, even, you know, even just sort of the rudimentary phase one, you know, pilot program to start to see that creating and reusing knowledge as the way that you're resolving things, not as an additional task that you have to do after you've solved the issue. Rather, taking the knowledge that you already have and augmenting that knowledge in the moment of actually solving the issue is so much more effective and ultimately more efficient. Now, I will say 100%, and anyone who has done KCS and anyone who teaches it and implements it professionally will tell you this. The phase one, of implementation, you will generally see a dip in performance because it is all new. We're doing things differently. And we don't have all this knowledge already at our fingertips, right? As the knowledge increases, you're going to get just inherently faster at doing things because you've got more stuff to do or more stuff to work with. So you will see like a there there will be that kind of that kind of drop off at the beginning and then you know and then you will start to see this this gradual rise and eventually that will start to plateau and then you kind of move into the next phase which is to refine refine the program even further but but I find that most service desk employees honestly when faced with this initially it's daunting don't get me wrong I I I, I will I will not uh, I will not sugarcoat that but the reality is is just even a little bit of experience of actually doing it um, for those that I've worked with, immediately gets their gets them right in the game. They they are like, yeah, no, this is this is so much better than the way we used to do it. Now we have to be careful because sometimes the desire is to make it like you must do these. These are things you have to do when you know, and and we turn it into like this punitive you know draconian thing. It's supposed to be empowering, not repressive um, or oppressive, I should say you know, we need to, we want to encourage them to share and to, and to make the mistakes early on. This is something, you know, this is something we've so, for so long tried to eliminate mistakes in our workplace. And, and I can tell you that, you know, I have made at least three mistakes in the last 20 years. Huh. It just, you know, just happens. No, I mean, we're making, we, we always, we all make mistakes, right? It, this, it's just, it is human nature. And, and we can't, we have to continue to encourage that, oh yeah, you know what? Yep, nope, that didn't quite work the way we expected it to. Let's move forward and make it work next time. I have seen KCS uh, environments that have gone wrong, like I've, I've gone in on other types of consulting engagements where the KCS implementation had been done, you know, a year or so before. And, and I come in and they're all just like, you know, the whole thing is about, you know, if you don't create an article, you know, if you don't create 100 articles this week, you're fired, which is like, why? <laughs> That's a terrible idea. So you don't want to turn it into a, into a, you know, into a stick. It should be empowering. That's the thing. Like it, it, it does. And it does. Once you start doing it, if you're, if you're really, if you're really committed to it, it does. It empowers you as a service desk employee to say, I know a lot of stuff. And I can share that and other people know a lot of stuff and they're sharing it with me and we're be collectively becoming better at what we do and making people, making our customers more satisfied, which means, again, people aren't calling to complain, which is, you know, certainly a goal, I think, as a service desk tech. I'm going to get real, uh, I'm going to get real marketing on this and go ahead and let everyone know that our next KCS training class is October 5th through 7th. 
live virtual. Mark, are you teaching that one? Uh, I am. Mark will be your instructor for that class. It's a fun class. I haven't taken the, the full thing, but I've gotten a, a preview of it. And it's some really interesting stuff getting into swarming techniques and different roles. It's pretty cool. So yeah, sign up for that class, won't you? It'll be fun. Okay, we've got, can you quickly get through one more question? I believe. I can do my best. Okay. This one is from Keith, and he says, how well does KCS work without a dedicated knowledge manager? Ah, interesting. Dedicated knowledge manager. Uh, you know, KCS does not really identify a dedicated knowledge manager as even one of the roles. Uh, leadership, certainly. There, there are leaders involved and leaders in the organization that are involved, but KCS is, is again, much more about mentoring, uh, you know, coaching and... So we have, we have workers, as I mentioned, right? Candidates, contributors, and publishers. Those are the folks on the front lines. And then we have coaches. And the coaches are the ones, they're, they're kind of the experts in the practices of KCS who support the development of the competencies. And, and, and they are developing those candidates into publishers. And they're, you know, kind of peers most of the time. But, you know, they're, and then there's also what we call domain experts. But they're, you know, the interesting thing is there is no specific role in KCS for a dedicated knowledge manager. This is where we come back to this idea of collective ownership. We're all responsible for knowledge. Um, we all fall somewhere on that spectrum. And like I said, I mean, there, of course, there's governance and, and policy making that lead that organizational leadership is going to be is going to be making. But you know, your domain experts, which are sort of the, the folks who do the evolve loop pieces, right, the more strategic and tactical stuff, they're the ones that are probably writing most of that, that are probably writing the governance and the policies. They're going to organizational leadership to kind of get buy-in and sign off. But yeah, there, there actually is no specific role in KCS for a knowledge manager. So how does it work? Pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, right under the wire. Cool, I think I'm gonna go ahead and wrap it up here. Um, we've got a couple couple other questions that we're floating. We'll include those in a follow-up email where you'll get the video of the session and all of that too. I want to make sure everybody's questions get answered. Kendall, I see your question about ShareWell. I'm getting with our solutions consultants on that to get you an answer. I'll email you separately the response to that question. So thanks everybody for your time today. Um, I hope you got everything you hoped from good old Mark out of this one. Mark, thank you for your time. I know you're crazy busy this week and we'll see you guys next time. Well, thank you all very much for yeah. attending. Bye. Thank you.